So once, it, once again, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Kai Dubay. I'm the Stewardship Officer for Rackham. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this special program celebrating our generous donors and our remarkable students that you support. Uh, we can't wait to host you at Rackham once again, but we're excited to have this opportunity to thank you from afar uh, for all that you do for graduate education at Michigan. Uh, later in the program, you'll hear a little bit uh, from some of these outstanding student scholars and you'll have a chance to uh, engage with them and ask them questions as well. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, recognize and thank some of the folks behind the scenes who are joining us today. Um, I have my colleagues here from the development team, but we also have some colleagues from our fellowships and financial aid team. Uh, they are the ones who kind of make sure that, that uh, those generous donor funds make it to the students uh, who need it. So uh, thank you so much, I see Adam. Uh, Lucier with us. He works directly with our students to get that work done. Him and his team do a lot of great work on that end. So thank you. Uh, now I'm excited to introduce Dean Mike Solomon, who will share a Rackham update, followed by a question and answer. So as he's speaking, make sure you go ahead and think about some of those burning questions that you have for him. Mike? Thanks. Thanks, Kaya. And I'll, I'll second Kaya say I'm very happy to have some discussion after these remarks. Um, I just had a quick uh, uh, audio difficulty, so I'm just going to quickly ask Kai if, if my sound is still okay. Does it just give me a thumbs up? Great. Thanks yeah. very much. So, um, well, thank you all as well for joining us today uh, on this um, kind of early or late morning, depending on what uh, time zone you're in or, or uh, perhaps even, even at other times. So I'm really delighted. Uh, well, first, uh, to um, be able to join you with some of our outstanding Rackham students who will be sharing their research and scholarship in a few moments. Um, but before we get to that, I wanted to share uh, just a little bit about what we've been uh, up to uh, at Rackham, um, what we have on the front burner in the next year, and some things that are launching uh, uh, really right, right now. Um, but first, uh, just for those of you that uh, uh, you know, we all would like to have you here for homecoming weekend, understand that um, that uh, it's still a very dynamic and uncertain time with respect to the pandemic. And so we really um, are delighted to have this virtual uh, event underway. Um, for those of us here at Ann Arbor, our fall term is underway and it's really, uh, it's been wonderful to be back. I think the students have really welcomed uh, the opportunity to have some of the interactions that uh, are really difficult are, are challenging. Like we can do really great things virtually and it's really wonderful, um, especially at this moment where we can be a little bit outside to uh, have the opportunity for us to be uh, together. The, in terms of background, one of the reasons why I think we've been able to take that step is that the university has required all faculty, staff and students uh, has a policy of around vaccination uh, for COVID-19. And uh, we do have a, a sense of optimism um, and about about uh, our term and the future here at Ann Arbor, uh, to within within a factor of the of the dynamicism and uncertainty that I that I talked about that I think um, you know continues to to be frank uh, does continue to create stress for a number of us in, in the community as we try to um, as we try to try to do our work to to support graduate education and graduate uh, students and so I'm really grateful for everybody in the campus that is kind of working together to to have the term that we can. So, and then to kind of the switch to Rackham, uh, in addition to that, we have continued to explore ideas to transform the graduate education. Some of you have, may have had the opportunity to hear me speak on, on this in previous years. And I really like to take a moment to give you uh, an update today about some of the ideas and plans that we are undertaking that are, that are launching now. Had a really wonderful state of the graduate uh, school uh, address on Wednesday that uh, in which we kind of did the campus uh, launch of these. And so it's very timely for me to be able to, to uh, update you today as well. So one example of what we have on the front, uh, front burner is our new Rackham doctoral internship program. Um, it's become clear uh, that graduate training today requires more than just exceptional academic pr preparation. Doctoral students who conduct research think and write at the highest level, they possess, possess, possess expertise that's in demand across just a broad range of fields uh, in our knowledge-driven economy and world. Today's careers, whether in academia, industry, government, or nonprofit sectors, demand an additional set of skills and experience. 
And uh, our doctoral students must now be able to collaborate within diverse environments, analyze complex problems using interdisciplinary approaches. They need to be able to communicate advanced knowledge effectively and provide leadership that inspires others. So for this reason, we're pursuing a historic shift in how University of Michigan doctoral students are trained and prepared for their careers. This internship program will allow selected doctoral candidates to pursue a fully supported internship as part of their graduate training. The internships offer uh, students a professional experience that could be in government, uh, in a startup, in a nonprofit, uh, or in a corporate setting, um, all being tailored to meet uh, the needs of partner organizations and also the skills and experiences of our doctoral students who have this just wonderful training and research and scholarship. So I think this initiative will provide a crucial experiential learning opportunity for students. It's one that not only illustrates the value of their training for employers in a wide range of fields, but also demonstrates to doctoral students the applicability of their skills and their research and scholarship of findings and, and, and methods in a diverse set of professional settings. So the next two items I'd like to address uh, that we're working on pertain to our, our school's longstanding and deep commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, first, I'd like to speak a little bit about the Rackham Merit Fellowship Program, which is our largest single investment at the graduate school. The goal of uh, the Rackham Merit Fellowship Program, we call it the shorthand, the RMF. The goal of RMF is to recruit, support, and graduate outstanding students who contribute to UM's goals of excellence, climate, inclusion, and diversity. In the last two years, we've staged uh, a review of the RMF that's been, uh, we conducted to possess best position the program for the future. It included a Rackham self-study team and also an external faculty review committee. And as a first step, uh, I've implemented a recommendation to bring all the elements of the RMF program together as one team within Rackham. Uh, we've also invested additional funds in programming and fellowships and I'm gonna to continue to pursue additional recommendations of the review teams going forward in collaboration with this new team. In addition, a major focus of our DEI strategic plan uh, is the development of, uh, and that's diversity, equity, inclusion, is the development of policy changes that address inequities in the graduate admissions process. And in so doing so, strengthen the diversity and excellence of Rackham programs. So we see an opportunity to further advance our admission practices uh, and this was uh, really generated upon review of the use of the graduate record examination. Uh, this is called the GRE, these general test scores here at Michigan. Um, extensive research generates that the GRE general test, which is a standardized test that has been historically used for admissions and graduate education, uh, research has generated, that, has generated that it's a poor indicator of doctoral student success in graduate school, particularly with respect to the measures of success that we care about the most and I think of degree completion and also the performance of research and scholarship. So using these scores, I also think furthermore extends the harmful legacies of unequal access to doctoral education on the basis of race, gender and socioeconomic status. And I also think the submission of GRE scores creates unnecessary financial and logistical barriers that deter well-qualified students from applying for doctoral studies. So as a result, Rackham is now pursuing a community discussion with the goal of ending the use of GRE and doctoral program admissions, beginning with the 2022-23 admission cycle. So over the course of the fall term, I'll be engaging with graduate faculty and others in the UM community about this proposal from Rackham, its rationale and its potential implementation with the aim of making a decision about this by the end of the term. So, um, and as I wrap up these brief remarks, I would like to conclude by discussing some steps we are taking to promote graduate student mental health and well-being and also to support students who seek disability accommodations at the university. So Rackham has recognized that mental health has direct and disparate consequences for the success of our graduate students. And uh, in this period, it needs continuous attention from Rackham programs, our staff and faculty. Uh, back in June, 2019, uh, in response, we set up a task force of faculty, staff, students and mental health professionals and their charge was to identify major factors that influence graduate student mental health and well being, with the goal of identifying ch changes that the Rackham community itself could take to better support student well being. One key recommendation of the task force that I'd like to mention today was the creation of a long term standing committee, no longer a task force, but a group, a resource 
that uh, can support the graduate school as it works to meet these goals in the long term. Um, in response, we've created, and I'm really pleased to announce, uh, the Rackham Committee on Graduate Student Mental Health and Wellbeing. This committee will, among other projects, work to create resources so that graduate programs are better equipped to support the well being of their own students at every level, from ways of connecting and communicating to types of academic policies. It's the idea to understand that academic stress uh, and stre uh, academic uh, uh, success and, and, and stress are related, and uh, we can. Uh, Rackham can provide resources to programs to help them uh, uh, navigate that, uh, that important balance um, and connection. So we also, um, we also have efforts to extend disability accommodations as we strive to make the campus climate more welcome for graduate students with disabilities. I look forward to steps we'll be taking in that space as well in the coming year, uh, specifically about improving education and compliance in programs, and also to an offer a workshop that will uh, increase uh, understanding among Rackham graduate programs uh, about how this uh, important support works in graduate education. So, uh, so thank you for um, um, hearing this brief update about uh, about graduate education and graduates uh, graduate students at the university. I'd now be pleased uh, in the next few minutes to answer your questions. And Kaya is going to be our our fearless moderator, so um, you can use the chat box. You can submit questions to her directly, or you can raise your hand, um, or however else Kaya wants to receive questions, and then I'll, I'll take them from there. Thank you. You can also feel free to just unmute yourself and ask. <laughs> we do have one uh, to kick us off, Mike. Um, we're wondering, with the return to campus this fall and all of the things we've learned over the last year and a half or so, um, what are a couple of the things that are really guiding your decisions as we sort of navigate this new type of year? Yes, so I think there's, um, there's a couple of factors that I would mention. Um, and I, I think uh, maybe two that I feel like I'm constantly uh, really are continually trying to integrate. So one is um, kind of listening to the university and the community, um, kind of reading and understanding about the dynamicism and uncertainty of the pandemic. So I would kind of put that kind of writ large as something the university is in many spaces offering data, um, offering kind of expert opinion or, or, and advice and, and uh, recommendations from a central central kind of group that is uh, constantly reviewing the data. A lot of that data is public. So that's one way I think for us all to kind of increase our understanding about, you know, we can read in the news about what the pandemic and, and situation looks like um, in our state, uh, in our country. And for the local context, I really try to rely on these publicly released data. And then just trying to integrate that with our need um, to kind of pursue our mission to support graduate students and graduate education. And how is the way that we can kind of do both of those at the, at the same time? Um, so th those are, that's one uh, piece that kind of uh, putting together. And then the other piece I would add is just as much kind of uh, flexibility, empathy, um, trying to meet individuals where they are and recognize that there's, a, there's many flexible ways to, to meet those goals, especially given the inherent flexibility and and um, open-ended nature of graduate education. And so we um, continue, for example, to have expanded uh, eligibility criteria for the Rackham Emergency Fund to assist students that are in unique uh, situations. And, uh, and the other thing, um, the last piece I'll say just before I wrap this up is really just being available to not just listen, but to engage in dialogue. So I think one, one change that uh, I've learned from last year that we kind of walked into as the year went on is being in continual conversation with graduate students through partnership with events that Rackham Student Government uh, puts together through students of color of Rackham and also through gra graduate Rackham International. This is a way for us uh, at the graduate school to just understand what the experience of students are, what's important. Um, I would just take an example that um, I think, uh, you know, parking, for example, has been just a huge issue at this moment for, for graduate students in the previous we were, we, there's not always things that we can do that directly as a graduate school, but just learning that this is what is important allows us to communicate that information through the university and try to support uh, students who, who themselves are very effective advocates for, uh, for their situation. So let, let me stop there, Kaya, and that just gives you a little bit of a sense of how we're trying to navigate the moment uh, through, through, through dialogue and keeping our eye on, on what we're 
you know, what we're really trying to accomplish at the graduate school. Thanks, Mike. We've got a couple more questions uh, more directly related to a few of the changes that you mentioned. Uh, Tom Cush would like to know if you could talk a little bit more about the admissions process and how it will change with the elimination of the GRE requirement. Great, thank you. Um, I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to address this uh, in a little bit more detail. So, um, so Rackham for many years, as, as I mentioned, has really advanced this idea of what we call holistic admissions, which is really uh, responding and understanding and, and uh, thinking about the goals of the degree and the multiple dimensions around um, knowledge, skills, potential um, experience that can, be, uh, that can be brought from the application. And so we already work with programs through admissions to have, even for programs that might be using the GRE. And I would have to say most programs in Rackham are no longer using the graduate record examination. Uh, that is uh, um, the continual literature in expanding fields showing that it's, it's, not, a, it's not predictive of these um, outcomes for graduate education that, we, that are most important to us has led to its de-emphasis. So the proposal that we're um, evaluating, I wanna stress it's a proposal, like we really need to go through discussion with, with all the graduate faculty, there's 3,300 graduate faculty, 100 doctoral programs, would be that those scores would no longer be entered onto the Rackham application. So the, uh, so the idea is that um, programs would have holistic admissions processes and they would not um, make use of this indicator that um, does not have does not correlate, or is, uh, it does not correlate with with um, the things that we care about for the degree. So those data would be unavailable. Uh, we need to work with. We want to have uh, programs work with them to understand what would their admissions practices look like. We really want them to be looking for talent and potential and achievement in the across the broadest set of applications um, uh, possible uh, from the greatest number of institutions. And this is all. Um, you know, requires time and effort by faculty, and we want to help them uh, uh, kind of walk into this in a way that is going to allow them, that I think will be an advantage for recruiting the best classes uh, going forward. And uh, I think there's some real value in University of Michigan doing this in, a, in the concerted way that we're proposing, because it will really put University of Michigan, uh, make clear to applicants that uh, we, are, we are looking at their potential for success in graduate school you know, based on, based on their experiences that they had as part of their undergraduate degree in the disciplines that they wanna study um, and not using a, a, a test that uh, has, has a, has a um, you know, uh, can potentially, uh, can potentially uh, perpetuate inequities that have been, um, uh, have been in, uh, present in higher education and even in our own institution. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the opportunity to talk a little bit more about that. I'm happy to answer a follow-up as well, if another, if there would be one. Thanks, Mike. We have a question regarding uh, the internships that you mentioned, the, the doctoral internships. Mark Johnson would like to know um, just a little bit more detail about the internships, kind of the funding around them, the support in finding those roles. Can you speak a little bit more to that? Yes. So this will be a partnership with the programs, but I think Rackham is really trying to identify I think the role for programs is to create space in their curriculum and to generate faculty support for students. So something, something we've heard from alums that have followed uh, uh, a range of, of career paths is that uh, faculty support makes a big difference uh, in this, um, that you, you don't, um, knowing that you're, you're doing this with the backing of your program. And uh, sometimes there's limits to what can be provided, but just that sense of support is really instrumental. So we would really like to work with programs so that they create a, a foundation or uh, a culture in which um, doing internships is really part of a successful doctoral uh, career. And I think that is changing across the campus. What Rackham would like to do is, uh, is help to kind of, if you like, uh, help with the match. So uh, engage uh, internship sites, talk to them about what the benefits are to have doctoral candidates with these really critical and important skills in research and scholarship. Um, and, uh, and try to pair them with interested students. We have some experience doing this. We have a program that's already up and running in the humanities and social sciences, and we've been pretty successful in supporting students and sites uh, it, through, through both getting ready to do this and then also some of the logistics of it. And the final piece is uh, really through, I think the leadership and vision of our alums and donors, uh, we really want this uh, uh, program in the long-term 
uh, to be to be a premier Rackham Fellowship uh, supported uh, through our community in the way that, for example, the Rackham Predoctoral Fellowship is and a number of the other fellowships that we offer. So I think this is also a key part. Um, doctoral funding, is, as, as, as you all know, is a really critical piece of success for doctoral studies. And if we can kind of uh, uh, um, take that on in the graduate school, that will increase the uh, engagement of programs, I think. So, so I think in terms of the, of the support, Rackham is really looking to, to provide, to have this be a premier fellowship program that is uh, equal in stature to, our, to, to the programs that many of you know about, our predoctoral program, our Barber Scholar program, um, I could go on and on, the Rackham Merit Fellowship program. Um, I think this is, this, is, uh, this is something that Rackham can contribute to the effort as well. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. And we have just enough time for one more question if anyone has one that they'd like to offer. Okay. All right. Oh, I have one. Oh, yes. yes. Hi, Cynthia. <laughs> so I'm Cynthia Marianas Gonzalez, and I'll be speaking a little bit later. Um, but I'm wondering, are there any, like, is there involvement or room for involvement for graduate students to kind of um, be a part of those decision makings or kind of research that's backing up um, all these changes for like diversity, equity, and inclusion that are happening at Rackham? Yes, thank you. So I think there's a, a number of opportunities and we're looking for, um, and I'll mention them, and we're actually really open to, to uh, addition, learning about additional ways to, to, for students to, to perform this work, um, to work with us, uh, to collaborate with us. So just a couple of things I, I wanna say just briefly. So within Rackham, uh, some of the ideas that we've talked about were really launched and formulated by what we uh, affectionately call RACDAC, which is the Rackham uh, Diversity and Equity uh, Inclusion kind of advisory committee. And that actually includes faculty, students, uh, alums, and, uh, and staff. So, uh, so that is a lot of the genesis of what you see actually has come from that advisory committee. Uh, and then also uh, Rackham, like through Rackham Student Government, um, we have uh, additional participation in the executive board and we're increasingly trying to engage uh, students on a, a number of the, especially advisory committees as well. And then um, the other thing I would just uh, mention two quick other possibilities. So Rackham will occasionally have the opportunity for, uh, for example, for um, uh, um, GSRAs or GSSAs to kind of actually come and do some of the work, particularly around uh, data within our institutional research group. And then also sometimes in programming development. So for example, with respect to the Rackham Merit Fellowship Program. And so those are posted positions that we kind of recruit for, just as all uh, positions like that would be um, posted around the, around the campus. And the other part I would like to say is I would really like to forefront um, student work within programs itself. So I really wanna be clear that for this to work, it kind of needs every level of, of student engagement. And so I've seen so much change within programs through student engagement with faculty leadership, either through a graduate student organization or a, a graduate student participating on a, on a graduate committee. And I, I really, at every spot with faculty, I try to just emphasize that that level of connection, I think is also critical to the success of any campus-wide initiative due to the distributed nature of how things work in the, in the graduate school. So I hope that's helpful. And I'm really actually open to other ideas to learn as well, because I, I, th I think this is, um, you might, uh, uh, just for the full audience, you may have heard kind of our, our tagline, if you like, for what we're doing. And we talk about it as student-centered, faculty-led, and Rackham-supported. And I think this student-centered and faculty-led piece, like the faculty do kind of um, give the curriculum, they perform the mentoring, but they really need to hear from students for it to be truly student-centered. And so I, that's where I think the opportunity is, is for that student-centered and faculty-led piece to interact in, in ways that are, that are um, deliberate. Hope that helps, Cynthia. I'm happy to engage more around that. Thank you so much, Mike. And uh, since we uh, do need to move along to get to hear some more from our panelists, uh, I will go ahead and thank everyone for your questions. And Mike, if I could have you introduce them, that would be wonderful. Great, thank you. It's now my delight. So thank you for that discussion. I really enjoyed it. It's really helpful to hear your, your questions and, and feedback. Now I'd like to kind of turn to the main event, which is to introduce 
um, our, our student speakers and there'll be the opportunity for um, um, question and answer with them as well. So I will uh, in introduce them briefly and then turn things back over to Kaya to get us, to get us going. So our first individual I'd like to introduce is uh, Shi Wang. Shi Wang is a PhD candidate in civil engineering studying human robot collaboration as it is used in construction work. Her dissertation proposes a transformative system to promote robot autonomy, reduce workers' physical and mental workload, and create a safer and more inclusive working environment. Through the development of what's called digital twins, she establishes the foundation of next generation construction work by transitioning the role of workers from manual task, uh, uh, manual task performers to robot supervisors. As a Barber Scholar, she joins a community of women who illustrate the importance of a global graduate experience and the impact of donors who see the brilliance in others. The Barber Scholarship will provide support as she strengthens her robotics technological skills and research record during the final year of doctoral work. Next is uh, Basun uh, Leyende. Le 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 uh, Basun is a PhD student in chemical engineering. His research focuses on the use of photovoltaic cells and thermal photovoltaic applications so as to convert thermal radiation from local hot sources to electricity. This technology is critical, very exciting on the path to addressing some challenges involving intermittency of renewable energy sources like wind and solar. He hopes to build a career that adds value to the global transition to renewable energy. Uh, Basun uh, received uh, the Dorothy Hall Brophy, Jerry Hall Brophy, and Elaine Wright Brophy Memorial Endowed Scholarship which he says not only supports him, but is a recognition of his efforts and provides affirmation in the face of imposter syndrome. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Nathalie Montplaisir. Nathalie Montplaisir is a PhD candidate in pharmacology and her work merges multiple disciplines to address complex multifactorial disease states. Her primary interest lies with G protein coupled receptors. These are called GPCRs, which are common pharmacological targets found throughout the body. She is currently working in the Smreco lab where she is identifying and characterizing specifically the Guy family of these GPCRs. Natalie is the recipient of the Phyllis M. Wise Award and is grateful for the support of donors who help mitigate barriers that may fall into students' personal paths. She notes this support as integral to stepping closer to her vision of being a contributor to the next generation of scientists. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Cynthia uh, Magdalenas uh, Gonzalez. Cynthia is a doctoral student in psychology. Her research centers on migration and race in North Africa, specifically examining the intersections of immigration status, race, class, and gender in Morocco, where she traveled as a recipient of a Fulbright research grant. As a Rackham Public Engagement Fellow, her internship was sponsored by the T.W. Kurczynski Family Fund. The goal of her work over the summer was to improve conditions and provide support for human, human trafficking survivors, an illustration of the great impact of her work and the generosity of those who support it. Next, uh, Cassidy Campbell. Cassidy is a doctoral candidate in, in American culture, exploring how black girls shapes, shape and, and are shaped by the internet, focusing on moments when black girls' narratives and ways of knowing uh, called epistemologies have been flattened by the inter internet's infrastructure. Her current project has roots in her experience as a support teacher working with middle school children with learning disabilities. With the help of the Rosalind M. Abrams Fund, Cassidy has been able to purchase transcription services and compensate her research participants for their time and generosity of sharing their experience, giving back, as she says, to those who make this work possible. So with that, I'm really uh, delighted to uh, introduce um, our, our our panelists today and really looking forward to, to, what, to, to what I'll learn from them. Uh, Kaya, over to you, thanks. Yes, and I will actually uh, just go ahead and have uh, Ji Wang go ahead and kick us off. Yeah, hello everyone. I'm Xi Wang and I'm a fourth year PhD student in civil engineering. I work with Professor Carol Manasa and Professor Vinit Kamat on construction robotics. Construction has a higher number of fatalities and non-fatal injury risk among all industries. While automation and robotics play a role in other industries like manufacturing, the construction industry is still manual and labor intensive. This is because the very nature of construction is challenging for robot adoption. If you imagine robot on a factory assembly line, the products move to the robot and the robot repeats the motion again and again. 
However, in construction, each building is unique and it cannot move. And the construction site is very dynamic and unstructured with moving workers, equipment, and materials placing here and there. The tolerance is loose, so the materials and the place where they are finally installed might, be, uh, might not be exactly the same as the design. And this uncertainty is, while the human workers can handle it well, it is very difficult for the robot to handle with its current cognitive capacities. So in my research, instead of letting the robot replace human, I let them work together. Humans can do the high-level task planning and handle uncertainties like a manager and robot, like the assistant, can perform physical work. They can do it quickly and precisely. And they can also perform low-level trajectory planning with their calculation capabilities. With this in mind, I proposed a collaborative human-robot collaboration system. And in the system, I created a digital twin for the construction site and robot in immersive VR, the virtual reality for the human to, you know, human to interact with the robots remotely in a safer workplace other than construction site. And there are sensors like cameras installed on site that communicate with the VR interface. So the human workers can visualize the const construction site conditions in real time from VR. And through the interface, the human can interact with the robot, send high level commands and supervise its working status. For example, after the robot developed a detailed movement trajectory, the human can preview simulated robot movement in VR and either decline or approve it to ensure safe operation. My current goal is to use deep learning and reinforcement learning technologies to make the robot smarter when interacting with human. Let the robot become a smarter assistant that understands human intention better and be able to perform more tasks with fewer commands. With the robot assistance, construction industry will be more inclusive and safer, and people don't need to be super powerful to work on construction sites. Overall, my, re my research aims to create a much safer, productive, and comfortable construction and built environment through human-centered automation and robotics technologies. In the future, I plan to work on developing an automatic connected interaction system among human, robot, and infrastructure using interdisciplinary research methods that includes not only utilizing visualization, interaction, and building models to promote human-robot collaboration, but also using physiological sensing to optimize workers' performance, mental status, and well-being. Also, I'm interested in advancing robot and infrastructure intelligence to achieve a better level of learning and interaction with human. And that's all about my research and thank you all. Thank you, Chi. Uh, once we uh, go through all of the panelists, you'll have, question, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions of each of them. So make sure that you're keeping them in the back of your head as we go. Uh, Basun, can I go ahead and have you go next, please? Uh, yep, uh, my name is Basun, I'm Roy Lindy and I'm from Nigeria. I had my undergrad in the University of Lagos in Nigeria, and I'm a third year PhD candidate in chemical engineering. And, um, you know, my research focuses on uh, the use of thermophotovoltaic, um, photovoltaic cells for thermophotovoltaic applications. Uh, so as we transition to renewable energy, uh, to fully integrate these, you know, renewable energy sources such as um, solar and wind, uh, we need to realize some form of energy storage such that um, we would be able to use this renewable energy um, during times of high demand. Uh, so um, I'm working on thermophotovoltaic applications that can be used for both, um, you know, direct uh, co-generation of heat and energy and can also um, help in energy storage. And um, basically we are using um, an indium gallium arsenide cell and we're also trying to transition into silicon just to reduce uh, the cost of um, the cost of fabrication of these devices. And also in future, um, I'll be thinking of the re repercussions that you know, comes with um, transitioning to renewable energy and its impact on um, minority households uh, where they use you know, um, higher energy intensive um, to um, higher energy intensive um, utilities 
uh, and such that they don't spend most of their money um, on um, most of their incomes on electricity uh, because they use devices that are not energy efficient. And you know, these are some of the things that I'll be thinking of as I transition, as we think about the technology, I would also be thinking about the human side of this technology as well. Uh, so basically that is my research. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Natalie, can you please share yours with us? Yes, I'll be sharing my screen real quick to make it more visual. Sure. Okay. So this is me. Um, I'm Natalie Montplaisir. I'm a Haitian immigrant. Um, I will stop the subtitles. So this is who I am. Um, so I was born and raised in Haiti, and then I immigrated to the U.S. eight years ago, where I continued my high school studies and undergraduate studies, and right now my graduate studies. Um, and I went to an HBCU, Tuskegee University, where I earned my bachelor's degree in chemistry. Um, and right now I'm in the in the pharmacology department at the University of Michigan in the Smirka lab, where I study these G protein coupled receptors that are found again throughout our body, and these are very important for physiological functions. And so right now they are the target of 34% FDA approved drugs. As we can see over time that, again, these drugs have been um, helping us target these receptors for the purpose of alleviating pathophysiological um, conditions. And so this is what they look like. They're in cell membrane. These are the GPCRs right here. They work with G proteins that again, can couple to them and allow diverse um, signaling pathways to occur inside the cell. So again, there are different G proteins, G alpha S, G alpha I, Q, 12, 13, and then the beta gamma subunit. However, and again, they are found throughout the body and are important for um, physiological functions. And so you can imagine that if there are any, um, there's any disruption in the signaling pathways, this will again lead to again pathophysiological conditions such as heart failure, asthma, and many, many more. Um, and so in the SMERCA lab, we study the G alpha I, um, the G protein subunit for further physiological functions. Um, basically, um, it's been known that this G alpha I binds to a particular effector that is adenylcyclase that I'm not gonna elaborate here. But um, in our lab, we do find that these G proteins can couple to other effectors that have not been shown in the literature before. And these are important, again, for cellular processes that translate to physiological function. So we're using this method in the lab right now that allows us to um, basically um, find out or identify potential novel effectors of this G protein subunit that is pictured here. Um, and then we do have a volcano plot that looks like here, like this, that allows us to identify all of these uh, potential novel effectors and further characterize them in our lab for the purpose of, again, um, producing new knowledge in the G-protein coupled receptor field that can help um, maybe patients or any of these interactions that can be important in any diseases. Um, and besides research, I'm also part of organizations on campus um, because, again, I lift as I climb. And I feel like being at this level, I had, did not have people who look like me. Um, I did not always see people who look like me in the STEM field. And so I'm um, part of these organizations where I'm able to teach students from underrepresented groups um, and again, show myself who I am and so they can be inspired to become scientists. Um, and with that being said, I would like to acknowledge my lab, um, the pharmacology department at the University of Michigan. My funding source is here, RMF, NSFGRFP and the NIH funded PSCP. And I would also like to thank Dr. Phyllis Wise because of her contribution. Because again, with science, I'm very focused on that, but there's also personal aspect that can come and kind of limit um, my focus to science. And so I'm very grateful for Dr. Phyllis Wise um, for her contribution in my academic career. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. I love that lift as you climb. Yes. <laughs> uh, Cynthia. Hi everyone, so I am Cynthia and I am currently in my second year of my PhD here at the University of Michigan in sociology. So I just want to start by thanking Dean Solomon for the introduction, Kaya and the team for putting this event on and all, you, all our alum that are here today and donors as well. Um, so my research focuses on immigration and race in North Africa, and I study a group of immigrants that are coming from the sub-Saharan Africa kind of geographical region 
and are trying to transit and enter into Europe and get stuck in Morocco doing so. And specifically, I try to focus on how experiences of mobility kind of shape um, gender roles and family roles as well. I recently have started focusing more on like activism and social change that a lot of refugees are kind of trying to push. And I think with today's political climate, this is becoming, it's kind of becoming more apparent that um, refugee settlement and immigration policies isn't something that countries can afford to ignore anymore because it'll just kind of backfire in the future. So it's, you know, kind of, I'm trying to be part of the debate that kind of scholars that find sustainable solutions for refugees. And so my own research experience or research interests kind of grew from my personal story. So my parents were immigrants in the United States. I grew up living in kind of Los Angeles, but also traveling between California and Mexico um, as my family had to relocate many times because they were seasonal farm workers. And so with that said, of course, I am the first person in my family to attend and graduate college. And I'm also the first person in my family to go to a graduate degree and get a PhD. Growing up, I didn't even know what a PhD was. I had, you know, as someone who was the daughter of immigrant farm workers, I never really thought that this, this was the vision that was possible for me. So I wanna thank you all for your generous support. Um, I was able to kind of build on my academic careers and I realized that with immigration studies, we also need practical solutions and not just academia and theories to understand the social changes that are happening and creating policy solutions. So I was able to intern this summer with the refugee led nonprofit because because I believe that at the end of the day, it is um, refugees themselves who know what they have suffered and can kind of, you know, similar to Rackham having like a student centered, I think policies for refugees should be refugee centered and immigrant centered, right? And I was able to do that and kind of use my research skills in a very practical way and help um, refugees who were victims of human trafficking or smuggling um, kind of share their voices and try to impact Moroccan law and um, create a, like a national law in Morocco that would kind of have a victim led um, policy solution for people who are victims of human trafficking. A lot of the times, many people tend to criminalize um, women and children and, and men too, who are victims of human trafficking. Um, so we're trying to kind of implement and push for solutions that are offering services and decriminalize um, people who have suffered so much already. And so now I am, as a second year, I am also kind of very involved in giving back to those people in my program who might have come from similar um, backgrounds as myself and who might not feel represented um, here in the university at large. Although I do want to say that I really appreciate the Rackham program because when I was trying to decide what university to attend for my graduate degrees, I just really felt like um, University of Michigan was just um, kind of distinguished from any other program because of Rackham. Things like the Rackham Merit Fellow, I, they have a huge impact on whether or not um, students from marginalized background are going to come to the university or not. And I think we're seeing that there are a lot of students who from working class backgrounds, first generation students who want to attend University of Michigan because of programs like RMF and things like, you know, the GRE being optional would all in kind of increase that attendance rate, I think. And it, it really, you know, among us graduate students, a lot of us have made our decision to attend here because of that generous support that other graduate programs in the nation might not offer. Um, so now I am a GSI, a graduate student instructor, and I'm starting to teach um, undergraduate um, in the university and I'm just trying to get back to mentorship and kind of helping as um, Natalie said, lift as I climb as well. So thank you so much. Thank you, Cynthia. And finally, Cassidy. Hi everyone. I wanna share my screen quickly also as well. Um, I think this is working. All right, so my dissertation, um, as you guys heard, thinks about how Black girls are shaped uh, are shaped and are shaped by the internet, but I'm also interested in the fullness of Black girls' um, personhood, and I seek to understand how they assert their own quotidian perspectives in the face of the same technologies um, that are often used to efface them. Um, 
and I also study how their lives um, become uh, two-dimensional in the pursuit of justice um, through national political agendas um, by different stakeholders and organizations that claim to be organizing on their behalf. Um, I feel that their lives are become flattened and, and don't account for the gendered, sexual, age, geographic, color, and class distinctions that animate their lives. And so these are the case studies that are um, primarily driving my dissertation so far. Um, there are three young Black girls who were wrongfully murdered. Um, Sakia Gunn is on the far left, then we have Kanika Jenkins, and then on the far right we have um, Taisha Millard, and they were all impacted by violence in different ways. But um, what's of importance to me is thinking about how can I write about them and it, write them into our history? How can I write them as important historical figures and historical actors who have left um, an impact, even though they aren't considered um, or wouldn't be considered sort of exceptional, right? They are ordinary everyday black girls that I believe stories deserve to be lifted and written about carefully. Um, and uh, this summer um, and um, with the funding, I have been able to, you know, interview families and, and talk with them about something that's deeply painful um, and, and, and deep, deeply harmful for them. And um, I think back to, I think Dean Solomon's uh, point about mental health, right? Doing the work that I do also impacts my mental health, talking with these families about um, some, some very, very tragic uh, moments in their lives and, and making sure that I do the work in a trauma-informed way. Um, and also making sure I take time to kind of rehabilitate myself as well, you know? Um, so I've made sure to, you know, surround myself with love and family and have a, a strong support system. But I think it's just, um, I think these girls' names deserve to be written about and not, um, again, as I said, flattened into sort of instruments for any other sort of political um, agendas or goals that, uh, don't really account for the fullness of who they were when they were um, when they lived, um, and so I guess my graduate experience has been, um, I think, due to programs like RMF and being a Mellon Mays Fellow um, and uh, from undergrad, and those are the programs that have sustained me and helping me navigate what it means to go through graduate school, which can be really a, a mystified place. Um, and it shouldn't be, but I think <clears throat> what's important to me is that I've been able to demystify it for myself and demystify it for the people that I'm connecting with to write about these girls um, and to, to honor them and to honor the girls that I'm writing about as well. So um, yeah, I think I've been fortunate to be able to find um, advisors that have helped me uh, navigate the work that I'm doing and write about it uh, pretty well, I'm hoping. Um, and that's Lisa Nakamura and Lakeisha Simmons. And so I'm really, really grateful for their um, mentorship and um, their guidance for the last, I'm in my fifth year, wow, five years um, as I'm going through this process and I'm just hoping to continue to um, indulge in all the resources that Rackham has to offer so that I can spend time writing and doing the work that I need to do because this is my ticket. Um, my dissertation is my ticket through um, academia and, and beyond. And so I'm hoping to just continue to write right now um, and I'm getting involved in um, other sort of you know, activist projects within the community that I'm in, but I'm mostly trying to make sure that I'm building um, meaningful connections with um, the different family members and friends of these girls. And then I've done a lot of work in the last five years in different organizations. And I think the theme is lifting as we climb. Um, and that's work I hope I can continue to do. But if I, if I don't do my work, then I can't help anybody. So right now that is the focus. So I just want to thank Rackham. I want to thank RMF. I want to thank Melon, my advisors, my department for being really supportive and, um, you know, especially Mellon for helping me figure out what it means to apply to graduate school and to figure out, be lucky enough to find a program that supports me so well um, and helps me to, to do the work that is um, in, in, of my best interest um, as well. So thank you. 
Great, thank you so much, Cassidy. And to all of our panelists, thank you so much. Uh, Suresh put in the, in the chat, it's so wonderful right. to hear all of you doing such uh, human-centered work, which does uh, seem to be the theme among so many of our graduate students. I would like to allow the opportunity for folks to ask questions if they'd like now. Um, please feel free to either put it in the chat or just go ahead and unmute. Uh, G, my name is Eric Monberg, and uh, I was a Rackham scholar many years ago and also worked in construction during the summers. And I was just curious, where do you see the first wave of robots having an impact? Would it be at the laborers level um, or more skilled trades, you know, carpenters or electrical work? Yeah. For what I perceived now, uh, it's like the robot is uh, in construction. It should be uh, should be work together with prefabrication. Like some of the small pieces are prefabricated uh, in factory, maybe also by robot. And when when they carry uh, when it was uh, bring to the construction site, the cons the robot can also do some assembly like. Uh, carpentry or either electrical or carpentry on that pieces. So that's what I perceive the, that can shift the construction industry. Thank you. Yes, I'm John Scanlon and I have a question for uh, Saroy Linda. The question has to do with uh, the way in which people who are working on energy storage throughout the country connect with one another or understand one another's projects and research. Uh, I'm an English professor, but I bring this up because I've become friends with uh, Professor Roy Gordon at Harvard, who is in the chemistry department and is working on energy storage with a lab and a group of grad students and so on. And I was just wondering, one, if you know of his research, but really more broadly, how uh, the different area, the, the different projects with people at different universities with regard to energy storage connect to one another and, and, and what's going on? Uh, thank you for that question. That's a great question. Um, so um, conventionally now, um, we use, you know, lithium ion batteries um, as storage and they're expensive. So um, due to, you know, the improvement in research, uh, we have different, you know, energy storage schemes, for example, I'm working on thermal batteries, uh, which is like a thermal energy storage. And another research is working on, you know, some other research can be working on compressed air energy storage. And we have gravity storage and a lot more different, um, different research. And they use, you know, different, you know, fundamental methods to store um, energy and convert back to electricity. Uh, but one thing is, even though they have you know, different fundamental me methods, they can be combined to store energy. For example, now, if I have a um, company or like some large factory, I can still utilize, you know, lithium ion batteries and also utilize thermal batteries at the same time to store, you know, electricity. So even though we are working, you know, we're working um, individually to make um, these um, different energy storage, um, we can also utilize every method together. And also, um, mind you, we also have the cost as well, um, the cost implications. So um, everyone is trying to make the energy storage method, um, energy storage uh, cheaper, um, such that, you know, people can use them. Um, so um, we would, we have different restrictions. For example, gravity storage, it can be restricted by uh, location. Um, and you know, thermal batteries, it can be restricted by um, um, insulation, for example. You know, so we have different, but we, the plan is for us to be able to use all these together in future um, to better transition to renewable energy. Thanks so much. Yeah, a fascinating topic. Yep, thank you, sir. We've got time for one or two more. I have a question if I could. If, is that okay? Yeah, um, go ahead, Mike. <laughs> yeah, thank you. My question is for uh, for Cass Cassidy and for Cynthia. Um, really, 
remarkable work that you're doing. And I, it made me think about it more having done it in the last year. Cassie, you talked about the connection to mental health and well-being. I wanted to ask just a bit about, like you are going into the community to, um, I guess I understand like to, to talk with and engage with uh, members that are, that are that have been impacted uh, in the way in, around your topic. And, and, uh, and Cynthia, you have work in Morocco. Did you need to adapt your methods, both of you, like in the last year? And if so, how did, how did you kind of navigate that? I know often you have a plan for dissertation, understands that things need to change, but this seemed like an extraordinary amount of change. So I would, I would enjoy just a brief comment from both of you as to if, like what that might have looked like or if I'm not understanding it correctly. Thanks. Yeah, I can go ahead and start. Um, so with the pandemic, it was really tough to kind of do in-person um, research. So I actually ended up, it ended up working pretty well. I was um, already in Morocco as part of my semester. And so I just ended up meeting with people virtually or on the phone um, and doing a lot of like interviews through that way to kind of respect social distancing, et cetera. Um, and, but in terms of the pandemic, it, it is a little, um, it was a little kind of under control in Morocco comparison to the US. So that was also very interesting um, because I, I, you know, I was kind of like living there and things were open, but socially distant. And then I would contact friends back in Ann Arbor and it was kind of the opposite here. So that was also interesting. Um, but a lot of my field work and, you know, things like the Rackham um, Language Fund was able to support things like having the appropriate language to kind of go inside of my community, the field that I work in and talk to participants and my um, there as well. Yeah, I also had to adapt and do virtual um, uh, interviews. The Zoom became my friend. Um, it also became hard to kind of uh, track down people sometimes because everyone was, I mean, we're going through pandemic, people were experiencing loss and, and all that other stuff and grieving. And so um, just being patient and reaching out to, I kind of somehow became a detective and would find certain people and call them and they would vouch for me and say, talk to this person and this and that. So I kind of really um, built a community um, of people that began to trust me. And so they could vouch for me as I got closer and closer to say, for example, the family of, of some of my um, subjects. So yeah, it, it was really hard. Um, but I think what I appreciate about it is that um, it gave me a little bit more room and distance so that I didn't have to fit everything into one sort of sitting or one week or two week period. I can come back a few months later like hey I know that was pretty heavy do you can we talk about this aspect that we didn't get to last time and stuff like that so um it's it's actually still allowed my work to develop um pretty well uh despite everything that's been going on great and then I just have one last question here and this one is for Natalie um so how first how did you uh come to work in the lab that you're in and then what is your greatest hope for the the work that you're doing Oh, sure. Yeah. So um, again, I was a chemist by training. So when I joined pharmacology, we don't do a lot of chemistry. Um, it's mostly interdisciplinary. So we use a lot of different methods. Um, so basically what happened is the first semester, I took a pharmacology class and I learned about gefilten cathode receptors. And I was very intrigued by how they are so important and they have these diverse signaling pathways inside of our body. And that they're just so prominent in our body and um, again, our common drug targets. So because again, I was a chemist and I liked organic chemistry and I like to understand how things work and I can also apply that to the biological aspect. Um, so I just decided to join the lab during the pandemic. I couldn't really rotate, but I was able to read papers. And then once I was able to come back to lab a few months later, then I started working. Um, what's the other part of the question I uh, what is your greatest hope for the work that you're doing? What do you, what is, what is the, the yeah. ideal impact that you'd like to make? Um, okay, great question. So um, because again, I'm working on identifying and characterizing novel effectors that interact with these three proteins, um, I'm working on one of them now, which is ADNP, and it's very important for proper brain development. Um, 
And a lot of the people that have autism, they actually have some type of mutation in this um, ADNP gene. So I hope the work that I do can somehow build onto the knowledge um, on what's known and can somehow contribute to hopefully one day another way for us to target or treat um, autism. That's if I work with this target or whichever target that I work with. The goal is to eventually start with the basic um, science knowledge and then we can um, build on that and up until we get to the clinical aspect of things. Thank you so much, Natalie. Well, we are coming up on our time and I, as much as I could sit here all day long and hear about our graduate students talking about the work that we're doing, I do want to be respectful of the rest of all of your days. Um, I would like to leave you with one, just one more thing that we have prepared um, just in honor of the incredible work that our students do with the help of such generous supporters. In an era marked by twists, turns, and pivots, Rackham students have shown incredible resilience. From altering their research and exploring new methods to coming together with their peers to meet the moment, the perseverance of these rising scholars is unmatched. And with the support of an overwhelming community, they continue their trajectories as top researchers and discovery makers. Thanks to you. Because in an era marked by twists, turns, and pivots, your support remained steadfast. In the midst of your own challenges, you kept Rackham students and their futures in mind. From emergency grants to research funding, your generosity and commitment mean the world to the University of Michigan. We applaud and thank you. Once again, thank you all so much uh, for your continued support, uh, your incredibly invaluable partnership, especially over the last uh, year and a half or so. Thank you so much for the robust discussion. I certainly hope you've all enjoyed hearing from these incredible scholars whose futures hold such great promise. And let's just give our students one more round of applause virtually if you want to throw up a reaction. <laughs> Uh, and I just, again, thank you all so much for everything that you do for uh, to support graduate education at Michigan. You've heard about some of the great things we've got going on and we couldn't do it without your help. Uh, we serve thousands of graduate students here at U of M. And uh, for many of us with us this afternoon, we know how important uh, such support was to your own journey. Uh, so again, we are deeply grateful. Thank you to our panelists for joining us today. And once again, thank you all and have a lovely Friday.